Hi, I'm Dr. Kunish. I'm a pathologist and CLIA director of the clinical laboratory at Torrance Memorial, and we're going to talk about SARS-CoV-2 antibody testing. As most people know at this point, there's two types of tests for SARS-CoV-2. There's the uh, viral tests, which is typically the molecular or the PCR tests, which tests for actual bits of the virus. And then there's the antibody tests or serology tests, which does not test for the virus at all. It tests for the immune response to the virus. So we're still figuring out whether there's good tests and bad tests, particularly for the small little lateral flow tests, which you may see the handheld tests. Hopefully that's gonna be changing very quickly with the FDA's new decision to have all of these test developers um, either submit their data to the FDA or submit their test to the FDA for independent evaluation. This is, this is important because although the FDA's initial decision to allow these tests to be uh, sold in the United States without review allowed reputable manufacturers to get tests out quickly, it also created a market for entrepreneurs to market um, tests of dubious quality. And um, getting the right answer is the most important thing. And hopefully this mechanism will sort out the good tests. And um, I predict that these dubious tests will disappear pretty quickly from the market now that this, uh, now that this, this decision is in place. So there are, there are two types of serology tests, and they're, although based on the same principle, they're actually very different. You have your large analyzer ELISA tests, uh, which are run in the clinical laboratory, and then you have your point of care lateral flow. The ELISA tests are typically much more reliable in general, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is that the uh, detection is done by a light or a, an emittance detector, which will uh, uh, um, gives you an actually quantitative number, which you can subtract the background and allows the test developers to create cutoffs, making positives and negatives and indeterminate values. Um, the lateral flow tests are typically just a visual determination of a line on a piece of paper, which can be much more difficult to read. Although these, these lateral flow tests sound like a great idea, you get a line and it's positive, and you don't get a line and it's negative, in reality they can be very difficult to read. What you might see is a very weak line, and you may not know whether that's positive or negative, and that creates a lot of uh, problems with interpretation. So. The answer that these tests give you uh, is, did it detect antibodies to SARS-CoV-2? What does that mean? What that means is that the person was likely exposed to the virus. It doesn't tell you if those antibodies are actually protective. It doesn't tell you, even if they are protective, at what level they might be protective. It doesn't tell you how long that protection might last. So it also doesn't tell you whether it's really there because even the best tests have a small false positive rate. And in a low prevalence background, that false positive rate may actually be a significant proportion of all of your positives that you're looking at. So you can't tell a person who has a positive result that they're safe. These ser serological tests right now are really useful for epidemiological regions, reasons. You can target large segments of the population or specific sets of the population like a political poll and determine what the prevalence is, how, where the disease has been, where it might be going. In those cases, a rare positive or negative, a false positive or negative test won't make a difference. For individual patient testing, where decisions are being made based solely on a positive test, the tests are not reliable. You cannot base any medical decisions based on solely on the results of these tests. 
that might change in the future when we have correlation of these results to actual protective antibodies and confirmatory tests, which will tell you definitely if they're present. But right now, we're not even close to being at that place. From the physician standpoint, we want to uh, be clear on some of the accuracy issues that are going on. Um, when a, a, a test is assessed for accuracy, um, there are two numbers which everyone is aware of, the sensitivity and the specificity. The sensitivity is taking a pool of positive patients and testing them and seeing what percentage are positive. That's your sensitivity. The specificity is taking a pool of negative patients and, and testing them, and the percentage that's negative is your specificity. Those numbers are reported for all tests, but when we vet a test, we look more into that data. For example, how many were tested. Um, that, you, you get a hint of that by what the confidence interval that you see after that, which is usually in the parentheses in the reported sensitivity and specificity, which is determined by your sample size. What is also important is, for example, for specificity, looking at the types of negative people they're looking at. This is like an error in a political poll which may selectively sample certain groups. You can so selectively sample only super healthy people and get really good data. But what you really want to do for a serology test is test a spectrum of people with a number of different conditions, including autoimmune diseases, other viral infections, to see if there's any cross-reactivity. The better tests, typically the ELISA tests, have done that. This new FDI, um, NCI NIH panel includes a number of HIV tests in their panel to test the SARS-CoV-2 serology because they're finding that HIV is one of the big cross-reactors with the SARS-CoV-2. So they're not accepting anyone for uh, any test for uh, approval unless it has proven that it's not cross-reacting with HIV. So you need to really look into these numbers in addition to the absolute number. Everyone wants to know the absolute number. Is it 98%? Is it 99%? You need to look actually into their data. Now, the FDA has set a bar for 90% sensitivity and 95% specificity with 30 samples for the positive sensitivity and 75 for the negative. The uh, ELISA tests that you see um, the Mayo Clinic tests, which we have used, the, um, the Abbott test, the ortho test, uh, the, um, they have used hundreds. And uh, the one I saw today that got us proved actually used, even used close to a thousand negative samples. Those are very reliable results with very small confidence intervals. Some of these small point of care tests have 30 or 40. And, and you can't, you, how do you believe that? And some of their numbers are just too good. And when this initially came out, we were approached by a number of these companies. And first of all, we weren't interested unless we knew the company and uh, they had submitted to the FDA. And we looked into the data in some of these and their data was just too good. It was not believable. With serology tests, you're always gonna get some cross-reactivity. You're always gonna get a few false positives and your few false negatives. That's why these ELISA tests have indeterminate ranges. That way, if they have an indeterminate range, you can be really confident if your positives are positives and your negatives are negatives. With these lateral flow tests, there's no indeterminate range. You have independent uh, studies now saying, oh, the test is better if we ignore the weak little one plus lines. Well, that's not very um, repeatable, right? Uh, and, and it's very uh, observer dependent. Another thing people forget about uh, when they're just focused on sensitivity and specificity is the predictive value. And this is something that's um, a little bit more statistically complicated, but it's really not that complicated when you think about it. Um, the specificity, which we're focused on here, is your number of negatives out, tests out of negative individuals. Your positive predictive value is the percent of 
positive tests that really have disease. So it's really two different things. And the way to detect a, to calculate a positive predictive value is to um, take your specificity and your sensitivity and your prevalence. So a quick example would be, say a test has a 98% specificity. That means a 2% positive, false positivity rate, that passes the FDA bar, right? That test is given the gold seal of approval. 2% still false positive, that seems pretty good. But say you test an area which has a low pretest prob probability, say 2% of the population has the disease. Take 100 people out of that population and test them. You'll have two real positives, and 98 real negatives. The two real positives will test positive. Out of the 98, two of those will also test positive falsely. Now, you're looking at your patients, you tested 100 patients, you have two positive, four positives, two of which are actually correct. But what do you tell all four people? That it's a coin flip whether you really have been exposed? The, in that situation, the test is really meaningless. A, fall, a, a, a positive answer is, is really meaningless. A negative answer is more meaningful. A positive answer is really meaningless because of the, pre, the uh, positive predictive value. I'm hearing a lot from my colleagues about what do I say to a patient who really wants a test? And our answer is always, what are you gonna do with the answer? And what that patient needs to be educated on is that right now we're not at a place where an individual test result is going to tell a patient whether they're truly protected from infection. Okay. So, so right now we don't know, even if a test is a true positive, whether that person is actually going to be protective protected. Just because antibodies are present doesn't mean that they're effective neutralizing antibodies which are going to stop an infection. And we don't know how long that's going to last. Other coronavirus immune responses typically last a year or so, but typically wane. Will this be the same? Will it, we, we can't make that assumption and those, those studies are being done. Some people have been asking if essential workers should be uh, tested for serology or, or, or other uh, situations. And our response is that right now, since we don't know what the results of an individual test mean, that this is something that's even potentially dangerous and not something that we're gonna recommend. Torrance Memorial is using the, uh, the serology test for our inpatient population under certain specific settings where we find that it might be useful. And that test result is being used in conjunction with the molecular tests, clinical findings, um, and, and other factors to determine the overall patient uh, status and patient care. It's not being used on its own um, for decision making. There's more to come on this topic and we'll continue to keep you informed. Thank you.